as the co-organizer of the meeting, uh, Joel Berry, who doesn't need any introduction whatsoever. Uh, Joel just reminded me to tell you that in the event that you don't want to be videotaped, just let us know and we'll be able to turn that uh, the video recording off. So, but you've got to let us know. Again, I think that the format for the first session worked well. That is to say, when you're done with your talk, just step to the side so that either the next individual can get up and uh, boot up their, uh, their slide presentation or switch out their, uh, their uh, computers. So the first speaker is, uh, is Joe Wu. Joe is the director of the Cardiovascular Institute at uh, Stanford University. And uh, Joe's title of his talk is um, Stem Cells and Genomics for Precision Medicine. Joe? Thank you. So, so um, thank you, uh, Dan, for the introduction. And I also want to thank uh, Jay and uh, Joe and GQ for inviting me here. And I have the timer here, so I'm going to go very quickly and stay on time. Uh, so. I'm going to, uh, so I think all of you are aware of the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative, uh, which is you know, trying to deliver the right treatment at the right time, every time to the right uh, person. Um, and a lot of this is uh, aided uh, by the fact that uh, with next generation sequencing, the cost of uh, uh, the sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper. So, and also there's much lower error rate as well as uh, faster. So for example, we actually send our samples to uh, Korea for uh, whole genome sequencing costs us about uh, eighty uh, dollars and turnaround times about uh, two to three months. And <clears throat> if you have the next generation sequencing, you have the clinical uh, patient, then I think right now the only missing link is a test bed that allows you to test your hypothesis. And I think uh, some of the previous speakers have already talked about how we can use uh, iPS cells uh, as a test bed. And uh, this uh, platform is uh, quite powerful. Uh, in terms of you know getting tissues uh, from uh, blood samples from patients, making iPA cells, differentiate the cardiomyocytes, and because it's genetically matched to the patient, you can do uh, precision medicine uh, and also understand the disease mechanisms. Now we get asked uh, several questions uh, when, every time when we do the uh, iPA cell model, which is, you know, what about the uh, different methods of uh, reprogramming these uh, cells, and is there a change? Uh, is there an effect? So, and this is uh, based on the fact that uh, if you look at most of the studies, uh, they will compare the different uh, reprogramming methods uh, based on, because it came from different studies, uh, it will be different donors, different passage numbers, different culture and conditions, and different labs, and all of which could contribute to uh, differences in iPS cells. So we decided to do a study in which we took a uh, single uh, uh, genetic, uh, same background, and hit it uh, with uh, six different uh, reprogramming methods, uh, lentivirus, uh, syndivirus, episomal, many circle mRNA, mRNA slash uh, microRNA. And overall, uh, uh, the gist of the study is that, you know, you're gonna see some uh, differences uh, based on which reprogramming uh, technique it is. Uh, and, and then these differences are actually different from the human ESL, but this is impossible to compare because this fibroblast came from somebody else, whereas the human ESLs also came from somebody else. So these are two uh, genetic, uh, different genetic backgrounds. I think the saving grace is that once we generate these iPSL derived cardiomyocytes within this cluster here, all these iPSL uh, derived cardiomyocytes behave pretty much the same, independent of the uh, different reprogramming technique. Then the other question is the cardiomyocyte that we generate here, how close are they to the human ESL? And uh, this is another question that we get asked because you know, people always ask, you know, how close are they to human ESLs or to SCNT, somatic cell nuclear transfer, which is considered the uh, gold standard. And as I mentioned, it's imp uh, not possible to study that because the iPSL came from somebody else, the ESL came from somebody else. So recently we did a study in which we took uh, skin fibroblasts and made iPS cells from that. And then we also did uh, SCNT uh, and created a nuclear transfer embryonic stem cell. And we compared the nuclear transfer ES cells and iPS cell. These two are genetically matched because uh, the same uh, donor uh, background. Uh, the IVF uh, ES cell, they're slightly different because the egg DNA 
is the same, but the sperm uh, DNA is different. So when we look at the iPS cell, the right cardiomyocytes and endothelial cells, uh, essentially these two, uh, which are considered acidogenic, uh, gives you very similar uh, cardiomyocytes, very similar endothelial cells, and they're different from this one right here. Again, I think the overall principle here is that the iPS cell cardiomyocytes or the iPS cell EC cells that you generate should be uh, uh, quite good uh, compared to ES cells and compared to the uh, uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer. So once you're able to generate these cells, uh, you know, you could do uh, different uh, applications, uh, for example, disease modeling, uh, drug discovery, cell transplant, uh, clinical trial in a dish, and um, uh, make it uh, more specific in terms of a uh, patient stratification. And so I'll quickly go over some examples we've done. Uh, <laughs> this is an example that uh, one of my previous postdocs, who's now a faculty in uh, China, uh, did in which he was able to make iPS cells from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients and show that these patients are myosin heavy chain 7 mutation. And uh, these are uh, mu uh, mutated patients actually have uh, increased intracellular calcium, which has calcium handling defect, which causes arrhythmia, which causes hypertrophy. And then you can uh, save uh, these cells or uh, ameliorate the arrhythmia and the hypertrophy by giving them beta blockers, ameliorate the arrhythmia by giving them uh, lidocaine with xylitine uh, So th <coughs> that's one. Uh, I think the other, uh, so that's one platform with using the iPS cell. I think, you know, s several of the speakers have already talked about this. I think the other platform with iPS cells is now the ability to genome edit uh, these iPS cells. So I think to help the uh, scientific community, we recently uh, published a paper in Circ Research, uh, Roboto is here, I'm uh, helping advertising the journal, uh, in which uh, we created the 88 uh, tailing constructs to knock out 88 different uh, human cardiac genes. And these genes are related to uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease. And all of this is uh, an open share resource, so you can contact us and we're happy to send these uh, cell lines and these uh, constructs uh, to you. Uh, so besides the disease modeling, you could also do uh, drug discovery, and um, this is something that uh, I'll just show you one uh, recent study that we published in which we uh, made iPS cells from uh, 13 different patients, uh, differentiated cardiomyocytes, exposed them to 21 most common tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These are very popular uh, chemotherapy medications for a whole variety of cancers. It causes uh, cardiac toxicity in about 5% of the patients. And we're trying to uh, develop what we call a cardiac safety index based on the cytotoxicity assay, contractility assay, EP, and so forth here. And, uh, you know, we're working with several uh, big pharma uh, companies that are uh, focusing on developing TKIs and using this particular safety index. Uh, you could also do this uh, for a, a uh, what we call a clinical trial in a dish uh, model. And again, several of the speakers have already uh, talked about this. I'll just show you one uh, a highlight that we did. Uh, this is done by Paul Burridge, uh, who's now a, a faculty in Northwestern. Uh, the title here essentially speaks for itself, how we can use a human iPS cell derived cardiomyocytes to recapitulate the predilection of uh, doxorubus and induced cardiotoxicity. I stole the slide from uh, Tim uh, Camp's uh, editorial uh, here. Essentially, he nicely summarized that uh, we recruited breast cancer patients. A year later, some of them have normal cardiac function. Some of them had doxorubicin induced cardiac toxicity. You don't know who's going to develop and who's not. But then once you, you can make IPA cell from them uh, and then expose them to doxorubicin, and then set up these contractility calcium assays, metabolism assays to predict uh, which patient is going to develop uh, cardiac toxicity. And again, this you know is this going to help us uh, better triage and better prognosticate our breast cancer patients who are undergoing uh, chemotherapy to prevent uh, cardiac toxicity. And then uh, moving on, uh, another concept is using this for patient stratification to make a drug uh, treatment more personalized, more predictive, more preemptive, and more precise. And so this is a study uh, that was also published uh, a couple years ago uh, in which, again, the title speaks for itself. We use such, uh, uh, RNA sequencing uh, to predict individual drug safety and efficacy uh, responses in vitro. We took a whole bunch of patients, made IPS cell derived cardiomyocytes, exposed them to rosiglitazone to coulombus, and we did uh, uh, bioinformatics analysis to help us predict which one of these patients is going to develop uh, cardiac toxicity and which one of these patients will not uh, develop cardiac toxicity. Lastly, for the cell transplant, 
Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, speakers uh, who will talk about the cell transplant. Uh, and so I'll focus uh, mainly using, uh, this is in collaboration with Beth Pruitt and with the Wolf and Zimmerman cell group. It's mainly using these iPA cells uh, to create engineered uh, heart tissues. And I think the first iteration is using them for uh, the treatment. Uh, and, then this, uh, and then you can see this is a recent paper by uh, Wolf and uh, Zimmerman's group that were involved. And then the second iteration is to show uh, that you could use uh, these uh, uh, engineered heart muscles uh, for drug screening uh, and also drug uh, development, which is really the main focus of what we're trying uh, to do. And so just to summarize, essentially this is what we do. Uh, you know, we uh, <coughs> recruit patients. I'm a clinical cardiologist and, we, uh, and then we know the clinical phenotype, we know the genomics, and then we use iPA cells and genome editing to help us uh, figure out what the, uh, these patients do. Uh, we're in the process of uh, creating a, a biobank of about 1,000 patient iPA cell lines and uh, we want to uh, perform DNA seq on these uh, cells to understand the genetics and RNA seq on these uh, uh, differentiated cell types to understand how they respond to different medications. We typically use uh, link it to the Farm GK database uh, and then we also have the clinical information from these patients and we're working with the SERM and also NHLBI and biobanking. And we're also working with the FDA on drug safety uh, testing. So just uh, give you a couple of slides on this uh, R24 iPSL biobank. These are the people uh, that are involved uh, in terms of making uh, these uh, cells. So in total, uh, we have uh, recruited uh, 11, more than 1,100 uh, people uh, with different mutations, uh, mostly cardiac diseases. And, and then also in total, uh, we've uh, generated uh, more than 750 uh, iPSL lines uh, from this uh, group here. And in total, uh, we've sent out more than 1,600 vials to more than 200 investigators uh, across the country. And this is really our model that is, uh, you know, the only way to advance science is to share science. So with that, I just want to um, thank my postdocs and the funding support uh, cardiology fellows, uh, the instructors in the lab, and several of them looking for jobs as well, and then, uh, collaborators at Stanford, collaborators outside of Stanford, funding support from the uh, CBI, from NIH, AHA. And so, and then uh, just one last slide, shameless advertisement. Uh, this is our uh, third annual uh, drug discovery uh, conference. It will be held on April 23rd and 24th. Uh, you'll see that uh, we have the CEO of Merck, CEO of Amgen, CEO of Novartis, CEO of Elegan, CEO of Networks, and then we also have Gary Gibbons, Maria Milankan, uh, the NIH, and Janet Woodcock, who's involved uh, with FDA Cedar. And, uh, we're also giving a Lifetime Achievement Award to uh, Roy Vagelos, uh, who is an icon in the uh, drug discovery area. So if you're interested, welcome to contact me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah.